afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, what I think is rapidly becoming a bit of a regular January fixture here, the, the charities update from uh, IBB and Kingston Smith. Um, thank you for travelling to be here. I know that some of you have travelled small distances, other people quite large distances. I really appreciate you turning up. Um, very grateful also to colleagues here at IBB who have helped to put this event together and also to our friends at Kingston Smith for making sure that it happened. Uh, it was Mahmoud Ramji getting in touch last autumn that jogged my, got my attention and made me think, yes, got to make this carry on happening. There may be a few faces here today that are not so familiar to you. Um, there should be a page in among your handouts that describes the, the core members of the charities team here. Um, there'll be uh, two of them here will be speaking to you later on, Rosie and Moira. Um, but just by way of a brief introduction, my name is Paul Rideout. I joined IBB uh, nearly six months ago, at the tail end of August last year. Uh, and I came here to head up our charities practice. Uh, Peter Burnett, who is very much the founder of the practice, is still around in a consultancy capacity, but he's managed to go on holiday for a month, mm -hmm. so he's not with us here today. And then beyond our core team of charity law experts, we have, um, we have a lot of other specialists uh, who look after our charity clients in other areas. So we have property lawyers, we have employment lawyers, um, we have people who deal with disputes, we have people who deal with uh, construction immigration and so forth. Um, I know that some of them are in the room here today. There will be others who will join us for drinks afterwards, so don't feel that your question should be limited only to charity law and regulation. And just one or two housekeeping things. We're starting a little bit late, but we're going to try to limit our spiel to about an hour in the hope that we can then have a bit of time for questions and answers at the end. Then we'll break for drinks at, I don't know, quarter past, twenty past six, see how it goes. Um, and then I think proceedings will probably pretty much wind up about an hour after that. Um, we had a, a sort of last minute planning meeting this morning where I was told that there are no fire exits today. But that was a mistake. What was meant was there are no <laughs> fire alarm <laughs> tests happening <laughs> today. Uh, so if the alarm does go off, then we need to make our way out through the, the doors that we came in through, out through the main entrance, and we'll gather in what I'm told is the park, just on the other side of the road. It looks a bit like a graveyard, but it's not. It's a park. Um, beyond that, I don't think there are any other housekeeping issues. Um, I probably don't need to say anything about mobile phones. Anyway, before I launch into the, um, the legal stuff, just a quick word about IBB. A whole load of words there which will be in, I think are in your handouts. Well, I'm just going to say a bit about IBB from my perspective. As a new arrival, I think it's quite potentially quite useful for you to hear about my impression of IBB. I joined, as, as I say, at the end of August. My first impression was that it's a, it's a friendly and positive environment. Uh, people seem to enjoy working with clients that they advise, and they enjoy working with each other. And that's more striking than it, than it has been in other firms where I've worked. Another thing that I really like is that we do allow each other to take time to get to know the organisations that we advise, listening to what their concerns are, learning about their business, and getting to know the people as well, finding out what people want so that we can, we're then better placed help them to achieve that. No, that's not working. Try that. There we go. Now, today's update is titled Lessons from the Past, Thoughts about the Future. In essence, it's going to be a, a rundown on what's happened over the last year and what none of us know about next year. The programme is going to be, I hope, fairly light in terms of technical content. Well, I'm not too sure about the accounts. I think the accountants might. They'll talk to you about FRS 102, but that's fine. 
Um, I will be, I'll be speaking in a moment about some of the broader issues facing the sector. Rose is then going to provide a slightly more technical update on the regulation of fundraising and on the particular thorny issue of data protection for charities. Then Moira is going to talk about the, if you like, the real sort of regulatory crunchy work of dealing with the Charity Commission, what the Charity Commission's role is, how it's developed over the last year, where it's going, and she's also got some um, case studies things that the Charity Commission have uh, published recently and some commentary on that. It'll then be time to hand over to Luke and Mahmoud. I'm good, I hope it's okay, I'll, I'll leave you guys to introduce yourselves in more detail further down the line. Now, I'm going to talk about how the charity sector is feeling. Charities have continued to hit the headlines for another year, and generally for the wrong reasons. In particular, there are arguments about how charities should behave in terms of how they set about raising funds, how they campaign for their particular causes, how they seek to influence government policy, whether they're becoming over-professionalised, whether they're paying their chief executives too much. And it's not surprising that with those sorts of arguments rumbling on, We've seen public trust and confidence in charities take a further nosedive. And according to the, the populist survey, which is carried out on behalf of the Charity Commission every two years, uh, the, the score has dropped from 6.7 two years ago to 5.7, which I kind of assume is out of 10, but I'm not entirely sure. But um, what I think is really telling is that the populist report includes some quotations about attitudes to charities to some extent, misconceptions about charities. So people are quoted as saying, more than half of the public agree that they know very little about how charities are run and managed, and this, in turn, makes them question the decisions that charities make. <laughs> That's quite odd. <laughs> then, across the public as a whole, and this is another quotation, across the public as a whole, three quarters agree that some fundraising methods make them feel uncomfortable. And two-thirds agree that charities spend too much of their funds on salaries and administration. I'm trying not to sound too angry when I read these quotations out. But the, end, the, the upshot is that charities are now trusted less, according to that index, than social services and the ordinary man or woman in the street. And I noticed earlier today there was another publication about trust confidence in the, well, in fact it was a study across the whole, the whole of the world, um, uh, an organisation called Edelman, has anyone come across them? They, they, they publish a regular sort of index of trustworthiness and NGOs have suffered a further decline in that report today, which came out today. And faced with this level of mistrust, misunderstanding, it's perhaps not surprising that the NCBO has uh, recently launched a, a nice informative little website, or do we call it a micro website? I don't know. <laughs> I look to you for a very specific reason. It's called How Charities Work, and it's partly funded by our friends at Kingston Smith, and it's seeking to debunk some of the myths and misconceptions about <coughs> charities and how they operate. So I'm not surprised that that's the sort of defence mechanism that the sector is having to resort to to try and deal with these attitudes. But at the end of the day, charities, regardless of their size, all do operate in an ever stricter legal and regulatory environment. And we'll be hearing more about that from Rosie and Moira shortly. Charities do therefore need to take more care than ever to stay within the rules <coughs> and to follow best practice. And that's a kind of professionalism that I think we all ought to applaud. And it's no longer sufficient for charities to muddle on through in an amateur way in the hope that they'll be forgiven for being slightly inefficient for them and forgiven for their mistakes and oversights. And again, in a, in a challenging economic environment, no charity that relies on voluntary income can ignore the need to find smarter ways to chase down their slice of what is effectively a, a finite pool of donors' funds. So on the whole, I believe we should be pleased to see charities taking a more professional stance. 
with trustees taking their legal duties and responsibilities very seriously and getting the most out of the limited resources available to them. But perhaps one principle that is in danger of being overlooked here in this drive for sort of greater professionalism and commercial acumen um, is a fundamental respect for the act of charitable giving. That, that act, that altruism is so fundamental to the concept of charity. I think it's one area where the sector or parts of it would benefit from a much sharper focus particularly in the area of fundraising, which we'll hear more about. We already have massively improved governance in charities, and the Charity Commission's guidance on that front is generally to be applauded. Trustees are taking their duties uh, very seriously these days, and that, that bodes well for the future. And there will always be some individual problem cases. Well, there's no getting away from that. There will be occasional charity scandals that hit, hit the press. But... If we, I think if we can crack the challenge of fundraising practices, I really think we can start moving in the right direction to try and regain some of that trust and confidence that's been lost over the last couple of years. Now moving on to some perhaps more specific thoughts about what's been happening recently. I'd be very interested to hear from some of you this time afterwards about the concerns that you think have been in front of your minds over the last year. From where I'm sitting, the list, of, the list on the screen could have been much, much longer. I just wanted to pluck out a few to sort of prompt thoughts and to offer, offer up some of my own thoughts about what's been going on lately. The first one is about legacies. And I've been checking on the internet almost every day for the last week, week and a half in anticipation of this afternoon on a particular case that you may have heard about. It, it went for <coughs> the Supreme Court last year. It's the case of Eilert and Mitson. It was the story of a, a woman who, at the age of 17, uh, became estranged from her mother. Uh, she married, became Mrs. Eilert. Her mother, when she died, had left all her estate or bulk of her estate to some charities. And I think it came to something like £480,000. Her daughter, Mrs. Eilert, was a little bit aggrieved about this and has challenged, uh, challenged the will through the courts. And we are now waiting to hear what the Supreme Court thought of it. Um, we're told that the judgment is due either later this month or possibly in February. But it is possibly the most extreme example of what might happen if someone challenges a will which leaves a whole load of money to charities and then someone, some member of the family pops up and says, actually, I've been overlooked here. I, I, should have, I should have got some of that money. This whole concept of overriding the wishes of the person who wrote that will in the first place. It would be very interesting to see how that pans out. I think that, will, that could have some quite serious repercussions for the charity sector, both in terms of the possible impact on income, but also, I'm afraid, possibly the involvement of, of lawyers in dealing with, with legal challenges to wills. <coughs> I wanted to say a bit about the relationship with the state as well. Um, I'm going to start with the sock puppet argument. It's an expression that I don't quite understand, but um, effectively, it, I mean, the, the story here is about the, um, the government's concern that uh, public funding is being used to support advocacy which is trying to persuade the government to change its policy. So it's sort of, why should we pay you a grant to tell us that we should be doing something differently? Now, there was a threat back in February that um, an anti-lobbying clause would effectively be put into uh, public service contracts as a matter of routine, effectively threatening to gag charities from carrying out a lot of their lobbying activities, which are actually perfectly legitimate parts of their, their work, doing advocacy for their cause. But the nice, the nice ending to this story is that this um, proposal was dropped in December, so public service contracts are not going to be not going to include that gagging clause. We've also seen concerns about the commissioning process, commissioning of public services from charities, and in particular the suggestion that smaller and medium-sized charities are getting 
totally squeezed out of the market because the commissioning process is too cumbersome, unresponsive, and will always tend to favour the larger organisations, particularly where public authorities are aggregating services into bigger and bigger chunks, disregarding the fact that actually often it's the smaller charities, the local charities, that are more in touch with the actual local needs of the, of the beneficiaries. But again, some encouraging news in December. Uh, the Minister for Civil Society, Rob Wilson, announced a selection of measures to try to promote better behaviour on the part of commission bodies uh, to enable smaller charities to participate fairly. And then the third point, uh, we've seen a, a few further reputational problems in the charity sector this year. And some individual charities' reputations have suffered in particular. Most notably, I don't know how many of you remember the... Um, the Age UK and Eon controversy. That was, uh, that was February as well. February must have been a really rough month for the sector. Age UK was rather hounded by, I think it was the Sun that, ran a, that exposed the relationship between Age UK and Eon. And there were concerns about, and the Charity Commission got involved as well and criticised Age UK uh, for not being clearer about the nature of that commercial relationship. Effectively, Age UK was receiving fees and commissions from Eon in relation to the delivery of uh, energy supply contracts through an Age UK subsidiary. And then there was the more recent controversy over a charity called Hospice Aid UK, whose former trustees were found to have entered into uh, a fundraising deal which, maybe with the benefit of hindsight and certainly in the eyes of the Charity Commission, um, involved excessive fundraising costs and didn't actually provide enough transparency to enable the public to see how much of the money that was raised would actually be applied in supporting hospices. And then a few words about the uncertainty ahead. Now whatever one's views on the rights and wrongs of Brexit, and some of us were thrashing over the issues before today's <laughs> session. Um, there may be differing views in the room about the rights and wrongs of Brexit, but, or even what Brexit means, actually, yeah, less and less right. clear. But no, that's a bit more clarity today. But I think what all of us do probably agree on is that there are some particular effects um, that may, may, may hit the sector over the coming year, two, three. One of these is uh, to do with exchange rates. Now, I was about to, I was planning to come here and say, look at the way the pound has carried on sliding down and down and down. Basically, it's been a downward slope for the last year at least. Um, of course, we have now seen, just in the course of today, a sort of a 2% or more swing up again against the dollar. But that's, when you look at that over the whole year, it's effectively, it's a, it's a chart that carries on going down, just a tiny, tiny little flick up at the end. So it's not really necessarily very meaningful. But my concern here is that with exchange rates looking worse and worse for people who are holding sterling, are we going to find, for example, charities that raise their funds here and use them overseas, suddenly their money doesn't go anything like as far as it used to. On interest rates, who knows what's going to happen on interest rates. I'm a bit nervous myself because I'm looking to move somewhere a bit closer to Uxbridge. Um, but when the Brexit decision, when the Brexit outcome emerged at the end of June, apparently we saw something like, I think it was the, um, the total UK pension deficit rose from overnight from 830 billion, no, 830 billion to 900 billion, just overnight, and has continued to increase. If interest rates remain low, returns on investments retain, remain low, how are those pension schemes, and that includes a lot of charities, um, how are those pension schemes going to recoup their, those deficits? Will a weak property market hit certain charities, particularly if they depend on rental income, or go back to legacies, on legacies that often take the form of, of houses that are left to charity? I'm going to skip down to recruitment. What's going to happen to those parts of the charity sector that rely very heavily on recruitment of people from other EU states? care and nursing sector, I think we have something in the region of 84,000 
citizens of other EU states who, um, whose status may well be in question. And that's a sector where there are already serious recruitment problems. On the EU funding side, at the moment, I think it's estimated there are EU funds available to the tune of £13 billion, pounds, which charities in this country are eligible to apply for. What's going to, be, what's going to happen in two years plus time? Is that source of funding going to disappear? I'm going to mention taxation very brief. It will be very brief. Um, one point here is that over the last 10 years, we've seen steps towards harmonization of charity tax relief. So for example, a donor in another EU state can make a donation to a charity here, and in principle ought to be able to claim charity tax relief in their own, in their own state. Will that disappear? We're going to lose that international giving. We may see some scope for change in one area that I know has been bugging charities a lot over the years, and that's on VAT. In so many ways, charities get treated as though they are a consumer, and they end up carrying the VAT bill. And historically, the main obstacle to changing the VAT, those VAT rules is to say, well, it's the European laws that dictate those rules. We can't change that. Well, maybe we will see some change. But just to put a negative spin on it, um, a government that may be facing economic challenge anyway is probably not going to take, be in a hurry to take any steps that reduce the overall VAT take. And more generally, before I talk about more public funding cuts, just finish off with a thought about actually about increased demand for services. Yes, there may be a drop in people's disposable income, so less money donated to charity. Company profits may drop, who knows. But Will we see an increase in demand for services as more and more people drop into poverty? May we even see, now this is me being very hopeful to finish off, may we actually see a revived interest in civil society along the lines of the, uh, the sort of revival, if you like, of the whole food bank concept in the last few years? Are we going to see a, a stronger civil society emerge from these challenges that we face? Now, I think I've probably just gone over my allotted time, but I'll hand over now to Rosie, who's going to talk about fundraising and data protection. Thanks, Paul, and hello, everyone. As Paula said, I'm going to talk to you about the developments in the world of fundraising with a focus on the past six months. I'll then talk about key changes in the data protection landscape, both which have already happened and will be happening shortly. These topics are closely linked as it's essential to follow data protection law whilst fundraising as the personal data of donors is processed. Kicking off with fundraising, as we all know too well, it has yet again dominated charity news in 2016. This is because the sector has continued to deal with the fallout of last year's negative media coverage and further damaging revelations have come to light. I won't repeat all the background now as it's familiar territory, but I will come on to some of the latest revelations shortly. To start, one major change is that we have a new fundraising regulator. The fundraising regulator took over from the Fundraising Standards Board on the 7th of July last year. The ultimate driver behind the new body is very much the need to restore public confidence in fundraising for the benefit of donors to have a knock-on effect in terms of charitable giving. We are hopeful that the new regulator will be well placed to achieve this with four times as many staff as its predecessor and to budget four times the size as well. This increased size is possible as the regulator is funded by a levy on the sector with the largest 2,000 or so charities <coughs> whose fundraising expenditure is over £100,000 being levied. Smaller charities won't be asked to pay a levy but they will be able to register with the new body from March this year for a small annual fee to signal their commitment to best practice in fundraising. 
charities, this fee will be £50 and will permit use of a badge which will presumably perform a similar role to the current tick. The inclusion of this band is therefore something to bear in mind when printing any new fundraising materials, particularly as the regulator has said from April they won't permit use of the old tick anymore. Something else to watch out for between February and April is a consultation on changes to the Code of Fundraising <coughs> Practice. This is required as the new regulator simply inherited the code when it went live, and so of course watch out for the new code itself. One more controversial aspect of the new regulator's work has been the creation of the Fundraising Preference Service. The regulator made its final decisions on this in November, and it's expected to go live now in the spring or summer. It's clear that the service will enable members of the public to register that they no longer want to be contacted by specific named charities for fundraising purposes by resetting their fundraising preferences. This small red button is a departure from the big red button, which would have allowed people to opt out of communications from all charities, which was originally envisaged and could have risked people blocking charities they would have otherwise been happy to support. Registration will be time limited to 24 months and the regulator will ensure that charities are notified of those people opting out, which will hopefully avoid the need of charities having to check suppression lists as was initially feared. Some elements of the FPS will however remain a concern for the sector. <coughs> Firstly, it will apply to all charity fundraising communications, even where the core purpose of that communication isn't to raise funds. So this means that if you're inviting people to events or including links to donations and appeals in your email signatures, that will be caught too. Another area of concern is that the final proposals have removed the opportunity for charities to check back in with their supporters to make sure that they no longer wish to hear from them. Some slight comfort has been provided by the regulator here, as the regulator has indicated that charities will still be able to contact committed donors in relation to direct debits and where it's in the charity's legitimate interest to do so. Another key change in the fundraising arena has been the introduction of new requirements in fundraising agreements. These stem from the Charities Act 2006 and apply to both agreements with paid fundraisers and agreements with businesses that represent that donations are made to charity. I've summarised the requirements for you in your handouts, but the main one is that they'll, they'll need to, the agreements will now need to include provisions dealing with how a fundraiser will protect vulnerable people and others from unreasonable behaviour. As a result of these new requirements, all your new agreements with external fundraisers will need to make sure they meet the new requirements and it may also be necessary for you to amend existing agreements to cover them too. I say may as whilst the new requirements came into force last November, the regulator has given us a grace period of five months to get our paperwork in order before we're in breach of the new law. Moving on to some regulatory action now, I first want to cover the new regulator's first adjudication decision in November last year. This demonstrates their commitment to working with the sector to raise the standards of fundraising. So the regulator criticised seven charities, which employed the now defunct fundraising agency Neatbeat, for failing to use all reasonable efforts to ensure that the agency's work complied with the Code of Fundraising Practice. The agency was guilty of, for example, targeting elderly people with aggressive fundraising techniques. What is most interesting about this decision is that it highlights that charities are responsible for the actions of third parties they use to fundraise. I certainly advise that if you work with external fundraisers, as well as getting to grips with the new statutory requirements, you also read the end of the regulator's report here to better understand what is expected. 
This includes recommendations that charities need to actively review their compliance training materials of the fundraisers and also to monitor telephone calls of fundraisers to reassure themselves that their campaign is being delivered properly in practice. The biggest shockwave, however, in my view, was sent across the sector following action not taken by the fundraising regulator or the Charity Commission, but by the ICO in December. The ICO is the regulator of data protection law, and in that role it has got involved in the increasingly tough stance being taken by re regulators in response to the crisis in fundraising. So I'm sure you all saw that the ICO fined the British Heart Foundation and the RSPCA, but what were these fines for? Fundamentally, the ICO took the view that charities had breached data protection law in three different ways. The first way was wealth screening. This is where they shared donor data with wealth management companies, who then analysed the donor's financial status in order to estimate how much more those donors could be expected to give, or persuaded to give. The second way was by sharing donor data with data and tele-matching companies. These companies would then fill in the missing gaps in donor data so that charities could trace or target new or lapsed donors. And lastly, the third way was by sharing data with other charities to create a massive pool of donor data to get details of prospective donors. What is really important to appreciate and may not have been accurately portrayed in the media is that these practices in themselves are not illegal. The breaches arose because the donors weren't informed of the practices and so they were unable to consent to them. It's important to acknowledge that the ICO is also sending out a couple of stern messages to charities here. One is that fines imposed on the sector will no longer be limited to data security breaches. The other message is that these practices, which have in fact been commonplace since the mid-noughties in the sector, will now not be tolerated without donor consent. A lesson to learn here is the need to review your data processing activities to make sure you can identify the legal justification for all of them. So if you are relying on consent to process data, you'll also need to be able to pinpoint in your privacy policies the basis of that consent. Next up, I'm pleased to talk about a more positive fundraising story. The Royal National Lifeboat Institution have flown the flag for a new system of communicating with their supporters to give control back to them. This is that they will now only contact supporters if they have opted in, that is actively given their consent to the charity to contact them. Clearly this is a bold and brave move and it hasn't been plain sailing for them. The opt-in project itself cost £3 million and a drop of income of £36 million over the next five years has been predicted. A year on after making its decision though, the charity remains convinced it did the right thing. About 42% of its supporters, which it approached, have opted in, which is a lot more than it expected. The charity's first attempt at fundraising from these opted in supporters has also been successful with an average donation of almost triple the amount from the same appeal in the previous year. New support has been attracted too, and the charity's volunteers have raised to the challenge as they are even more focused on raising funds in other ways. I'm waiting to see how many other charities take the same leap, especially in view of upcoming <coughs> changes in data protection law. Speaking of which, we are facing a big change next May when the EU General Data Protection Regulation will become a reality for the UK. And this is something we do know for sure as we will still be a member state of the EU then. This will replace the current Data Protection Act 1998. 
So the rationale for the regulation is harmonisation across the EU and to bring the law up to date with the digital economy. <coughs> At its core are enhanced rights for data subjects, which means more onerous rights on data <coughs> controllers and for the first time, direct obligations on data processors. I unfortunately don't have time to talk about all the changes today, but I will run through some of the main ones. In terms of consent, the regulation has tightened up what is meant by consent. So it will, in essence, be harder to obtain consent as it will require some affirmative step or positive action. Another key change is that there will now be a mandatory requirement to notify the ICO of the data breach in most cases, where the breach is likely to result in high risk to individuals, data subjects will also need to be informed about it. New and expanded rights for data subjects will include an expanded right to be forgotten and the new concept of data portability. And the enforcement powers of the ICO will increase significantly with potential fines being much more severe. So we all have less than one and a half years to become GDPR compliant. What steps should we take now to hopefully make the process relatively smoothly? Again, I'll provide you with an overview now with some top tips. You'll see that some of these recommendations I've already covered, which highlights the need to really prioritize data protection now. Firstly, I recommend that you make sure that the key people and decision makers in your charities know that data protection law is changing. They need to appreciate the impact that this is likely to have and to build in the resource implications to prepare for the new elements and also, of course, to raise staff awareness of the new rules. As well, I advise you to conduct a personal data audit this is to document what data you hold, where it came from, who you share it with, and the legal justification for all processing activities. You should also review how you are obtaining consent to consider if you need to make any changes there. Another action point is to make sure that you have the right processes in place to be able to detect and report a personal data breach to the ICO once the data breach notification comes in. And it's also a good time to make sure that you have all the procedures in place to ensure that they cover all the rights that data subjects have, such as the right to be forgotten, that is deleting their personal data. And finally, there's a slide in your handouts with some pointers on data security, as once you know what uh, data you have, you'll obviously want to do all you can to protect it. Thank you very much. And I'll pass on to Mara. It's all very scary with regulations, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to talk about some more regulation, I'm afraid. This time I'm going to focus on the role of the Charity Commission, um, its main functions um, and policies, and some of its recently published decisions. I'll try to make you laugh a bit if I can. <laughs> um, the Commission's main functions, um, firstly to decide uh, whether or not a body is a charity, and if it is a charity, to register it, and then regulate it. The registration function, if you like. Um, second, to encourage and facilitate better administration of charities. Now these days, most of that function is fulfilled um, through its published guidance for charities, um, although it also makes orders and schemes. So I'm going to call that a helpful function. Um, and then third, to identify um, and investigate misconduct or mismanagement, uh, and then take remedial or protective action. That's the regulatory function. Uh, now there are some other uh, functions, but with a significant reduction in its budget, um, over the last few years, the Commission um, is focusing on its regulatory function and it uses the registration process to identify potential trouble, or rather troublemakers. Uh, but ultimately, if a body um, is established as a charity, then the Commission does have to register it. 
Now, when investigating a charity, the Commission distinguishes between um, statutory inquiries and what it calls non-inquiry casework. Uh, now, as the name infers, a statutory inquiry, it's got a formal statutory basis, um, and once opened, the Commission can exercise some quite significant um, regulatory powers. Uh, but non-inquiry casework, on the other hand, doesn't have a statutory basis, uh, and the Commission doesn't have many regulatory powers, although they might sometimes give the impression that they have. Now, if it can deal with the matter without the need to exercise some of those regulatory powers, the Commission won't usually open a statutory inquiry. Uh, but having opened a statutory inquiry, and if it's satisfied that there has been mis mismanagement or a, a risk to a charity's property, uh, the Commission can appoint and remove trustees, it can freeze bank accounts, appoint an interim manager, um, order a bank to disclose the charity's bank statements, um, and transactions on that account, and it can require trustees to appear before the Commission to answer questions which are relevant to the investigation. They're doing that quite a lot these days. Uh, now, the Commission has got some new powers um, to give trustees a formal warning if, in its opinion, there's been a breach of trust, um, and they can also publicise that warning, um, and we call that the charity as both. Um, <laughs> trustees usually... Uh, they have a right um, of, of appeal um, to the first tier charity tribunal or the courts against the exercise of any of those, those powers. Uh, now, the Commission assesses the risk of significant harm, um, abuse or damage to assets, um, and also to reputation or to the services or beneficiaries of the charity uh, before it opens a statutory inquiry um, and exercises those powers. And it's got a risk framework uh, which was updated recently. Uh, now, the risk framework sets out um, the priority risk issues for the Commission, uh, which are, um, as you would expect, fraud and financial um, abuse, conflicts of interest and money laundering, um, safeguarding, obviously serious harm or risk of harm to beneficiaries, terrorism, using a chari charity for terrorist purposes or for fostering extremism, uh, and then what they call other serious risks, which comes a multitude of things. Um, excessive control of the charity by third parties, party political activity, uh, abuse of charitable status, perhaps for tax, uh, tax avoidance purposes, uh, where there's been a history of non-compliance, non-filing of accounts, etc. Uh, reliance on a sole source of fund financing, that's often regarded as a risk area. Um, inadequate or no reserves, that's a fairly recent one. Um, and last but not least, poor governance. Uh, now, these are the risk factors which helps the Commission uh, to determine whether or not to use its regulatory powers. Uh, but safeguarding and terrorism um, are not something that the Charity Commission um, has any idea about or knows what to do with. Uh, they fall outside of their areas um, of expertise. In reality, the Commission is motivated by a risk of bad publicity um, for the charitable sector as a whole, um, including unwelcome press attention, and criticism of the Charity Commission by MPs and, and parliamentary committees and the media. Uh, and you may recall that this happened a few years ago in the case of the Cup Trust, uh, which was about tax evasion using a charity. So the Commission is almost compelled to act for fear of being criticised for not being tough enough, and it nearly always publishes a written report on the outcome of a statutory um, inquiry. Now, some would say, unfortunately, the Commission has developed a habit of issuing a press release to the effect that it has opened a statutory inquiry, or an odd inquiry case even, before it has begun its inquiry. Now, one trustee told me that it's a bit like being hung before the outcome of a trial, and in some cases there is an <coughs> argument that these premature press releases could be defamatory. Now, as an example, uh, not necessarily linked to this, but the Commission announced uh, that it has opened a statutory inquiry into Ampleforth Abbey, which is an independent school, uh, and St Lawrence Education Trust, uh, to investigate the trustee's approach to safeguarding and handling of allegations of sexual abuse. Now, the Commission will say that the public wants to know what it is doing and requires reassurance that it is protecting charitable money or beneficiaries. Others would say that this is window dressing and possibly... <coughs> a cost-effective and even cynical way of appearing to be a more effective regulator. You must take your choice. Uh, but having said that, it is important to note that notwithstanding all of the guidance uh, which is published by the Charity Commission and the stepping up of its regulatory work, 
its investigations and compliance work show that financial abuse, mismanagement and serious governance failures are still at the top of the list. So bearing in mind that risk framework, which I've just told you about, let's measure it against some of the cases which have been uh, reported recently. Um, and the first one is um, filing obligations generally. Uh, the Commission launched class inquiries into charities who were in breach of their statutory duty to file um, annual reports, accounts um, and returns for two or more years. And the first phase focused on charities uh, with an arsenal income um, of more than half a million pounds. And the second phase focused on charities with an last known income of between a quarter of a million and half a million pounds. Now, the Commission's published reports show that it is using its information gathering powers to obtain bank records and direct trustees to prepare uh, and complete accounts for submission. Um, and the Commission, I have to say, has been very effective at this exercise. Uh, the reports make it quite clear that the death of a trustee's grandmother, car breakdown, the resignation of a charity staff, um, and the destruction of records by fire are not good excuses for failure um, by trustees to comply with their filing um, obligations within the prescribed time limits. It's a fair cop, though. <laughs> the objects of the Badger Trust um, are to promote and enhance welfare, conservation um, and protection of badgers, their sets and their habitats for the public benefit. Now, during the run-up to the last um, general election, the trustees of the Badger Trust supported a march which, which was entitled Stop Cameron's Cull, um, which had been organised by its chief executive, who is a wildlife campaigner. Now, the protesters opposed the Conservative Party's policy of tackling bovine TB by culling badgers. Now, the charity had also contributed to the manifesto of another political party, uh, and the Commission decided that the charity's political neutrality had been called into question um, and that it was in breach of the legal prohibition um, on charitable support of party politics. Now, the trustees were required to remove material from the charity's website, including Mr Cameron's name, um, and to publish material which disassociated the charity from the public march, which hadn't even been organised um, by the charity in the first place. The sole object of Islamic Network is the advancement of the Islamic religion. Uh, the Commission received a complaint that the charity had published extremist material on its website, including homophobic um, statements which appeared to condone murder. Now, the Commission found this material. It was hidden from view in archived historic web data. Uh, <clears throat> it transpired that the existing trustees had inherited this website from previous trustees and that these trustees knew nothing about the offending material uh, which had been put there by a former trustee um, of the charity. Uh, there were also some public events which had been hosted by the charity, apparently of which some speakers made what the Commission regarded as unacceptable comments, uh, and apparently there were a host of other governance failures. Now the Commission set the trustees an action plan. Uh, they were required to appoint additional trustees uh, in order to comply with their requirements in the governing document. Um, and they were also required to prepare guidelines for public speaking at charity events. In other words, guidance on what speakers could and couldn't say. Um, they were required to prepare an operations manual, financial policies and procedures, all of which were absent, um, and to conduct appropriate due diligence um, of those with whom the charity was working to ensure that they were suitable partner organisations having regard to the charity's objects of advancing the Islamic religion. Bitech, Bitech's objects are to advance the education of the public, in particular by the provision of vocational training. Uh, but the Commission found that there were significant discrepancies between the charity's reported income and expenditure and the actual movement of funds um, on the bank account over a four year period. Approximately a million pounds of income and 700,000 pounds of expenditure uh, had not been declared in the accounts. Uh, two of the trustees were also directors of a company which was the landlord of a premises occupied by the charity to which they paid a significant amount of money. But there was no charitable activity at this charity, or at least not of the kind which fell within the charity's um, objects. Uh, they were invited to the commission to explain uh, what they were doing with these premises and they were unable to do so. Conflicts of interest hadn't been managed. There were significant weaknesses in the charity's governance uh, and the commission ordered them to get their act together and to improve, improve their performance. 
um, I don't know if anyone has read about the ten-part temple of the, of the Jedi Order. Uh, it was reported uh, that in the replies to the government at the last census on religious beliefs, an extraordinary number of individuals reported that they were Jedi Knights. Um, fans of the Star Wars films may well remember this, uh, but some people have taken it further, um, adopting some of the principles of Jediism in the film to perpetuate and define Jediism as a religion based on the observance of the Force, um, the ubiquitous and metaphysical power that a Jedi, that is a follower of Jediism, believes to be the underlying fundamental nature of the universe. Now the temple of the Jedi Order applied to the Charity Commission for registration as a charitable incorporated organization uh, last year. And the purposes with which it proposed to be registered were to advance the religion of Jediism for the public benefit worldwide uh, in accordance with the Jedi doctrine uh, and to advance other purposes. Now the commission decided that it wouldn't qualify for charitable status as it wouldn't be established for the uh, advancement of religion or the promotion of moral and ethical improvement for the benefit of the public, both of which are uh, established charitable purposes. It's open to them to appeal, of course. Thank you. Based at our Heathrow office, which is at the old vinyl factory just outside Hazen Harbour Station. Uh, Kingston Smith, we're, we're a firm based in London and the South East. We've got six offices in and around London, including in the city. Um, and a number of my colleagues, Luke's here at the front, and a number of my colleagues are in the audience. So do feel free to talk to us afterwards. So, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk spend the next 10 minutes or so on conscious of time. Um, I will spend the next 10, 12 minutes or so talking to you a little bit about the accounting implications of charities that have happened in 2016 and some of what we've got to look forward to in 2017. So, 2016. 2016 was the year of the new SORP. Many of you will have spent the year implementing. I think it's been um, it's been fiddly. I don't think we've had lots of dramatic changes, but most clients that I speak to have, have talked about how fiddly it has been getting all the additional disclosures in. And unfortunately, um, it's going to carry on in that vein, I think, as, as things change. Oh, all right, right. I'll talk a bit more. For smaller charities, in 2016, you've been able to follow the Frizzy SORP, which has been uh, something in place for, for a little bit of time. Unfortunately, sorry, SORP and Frizzy. Ah, uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so SORP is the statement of recommended practice. That is the main standard that, that account, the charities have to follow, which basically takes normal accounting legislation for corporate entities and converts it to, to charity. That's essentially what that does. Frizzy is essentially a specific document for small charities. So Frizzy was financial reporting standard for smaller entities. So really, what that meant was that there was a year's reprieve for smaller charities. The accounting for 2016 was relatively straightforward. For 2017, they'll have to go through the changes that the larger charities went through. One of the more helpful um, changes in 2016, certainly for a lot of smaller charities, was that the audit threshold was raised to £1 million income. And that took a number of smaller charities out of audit scope. And, and where there were group situations, the need to actually consolidate a set of accounts where a, there's a charity and a subsidiary, again, that, that threshold went up to £1 million. Again, that did reduce the burden for, for a number of, um, number of smaller charities.
so the sort. So the changes that came in for larger charities this year resulted in a number of changes for, for larger charities. There were a number of additional disclosures required in the trustees report, or where those disclosures were in place, those disclosures needed to be more specific and more detailed. Uh, I was certainly talking to one or two people beforehand, and actually in implementing this, it's taken quite a lot of time, and that's something that the smaller charities will just need to be aware of. Some of these changes, I mean, you know, one, one I'd pick out there is key management. There's a requirement to, to define who key management are. That's, that results in quite a lot of conversation and thinking about um, that particular area, um, and, and quite a lot more disclosure on the risks that, that the charity is subject to. The core numbers for charities, in most cases, in, or in a number of cases, didn't change hugely. There was you know, a number of charities probably had to put in a holiday pay accrual. If you had a pension scheme, a defined benefit pension scheme deficit, some charities had to include that under specific conditions. But generally, most charities probably had one or two changes to the actual fundamental account. But for any of those areas, for any of you that are thinking, oh, I'm not quite sure what the changes might be in those areas, we can talk to, to any of us afterwards. What was more onerous were the changes to disclosures. And there were a lot of detailed changes to disclosures. One I'd point out here is estimates. So now, charities, and in fact corporate entities as well, have to include in their accounts disclosure about where numbers are actually estimated. So you might have an accrual for something. There might be a provision, because you might have a dilapidations provision in due course. That might be a significant number. Again, if it is a significant number, that's additional disclosure that goes into the accounts. Related parties, and we'll come on to that in a moment, there's more and more focus on disclosing detail. And that is the direction of travel in terms of where, where, where accounting regulation is going. So, we all breathed a sigh of relief that uh, the new SORP is in place and we understood it. Well, actually, they'll revise it in three years' time, <laughs> unfortunately. So what does that mean? So the consultation process for that takes some time. What happened was that in 2016, that a consultation exercise was launched by the regulators they will now review that and publish an expo exposure draft in 2017. That uh, consultation closed on the 11th of December. And it in also included some suggestions from the SORP committee, which is the, the group of people that actually advises the regulators on setting that standard up. Some of the the highlights, if you can call it that, um, in terms of um, what the committee was suggesting. And some of these are very helpful, some we'll have to think about. An extra layer of reporting for very large charities. There's beginning to be a recognition that actually, you know, there are charities, perhaps, I mean, the, the, the committee suggested that charities with an income of over 10 million should be regarded as large. And therefore, that might well be helpful in the future for more onerous reporting requirements to only be subject to those very large charities. So you can understand the rationale for that coming in, in, into play. How that will come through in the exposure draft, we'll have to see. There's a suggestion around putting in a key fact summary into every annual report. Again, in principle, that sounds like a very good idea, but it's an additional piece of information to put in. And actually, how many charities are truly comparable? So what will we actually achieve by doing that? So those are the questions that are being asked. And again, there'll be an opportunity to comment when the exposure draft comes out um, this year. One I think we, we're reasonably supportive of is scrapping the support cost category. Again, it's interpreted in different ways. So, so, so there are, again, you can see where we're going with this. There's again some detailed changes that will be coming in for 2019 
which are beginning to be signposted from now. So as we've said on the slides, <coughs> we'll get the new detail on that, um, the exposure draft for that this year. The regulator put its own thoughts in terms of themes for making changes, and I'm, I'm not going to go through all of those, but what it does, and you can see it, you can Google it and see some of the detail, it's actually reasonably easy sort of material to read, but actually you, that gives you a sense of where the regulator's focus is in terms of what it wants in annual reports going forward. What are the areas that it's looking at? And going concerns are a really interesting one in that it's saying, actually, let's look further out. If you've got a defined benefit pension scheme with a deficit, how does that impact the viability of the charity going forward? If you're reliant on one funder, how does that impact? So there are, you know, that, that's one area where, where, where the Charity Commission are, are sort of you know, thinking about in terms of making changes to, to regulation. I'll rattle through a couple of other relevant areas. If your charity has a subsidiary that gift dates all its taxable profits up to the parent, which a number of charities do where, they put, where the trading is, is taking place in a subsidiary, talk to your advisors or to us. Because it's possible, because of revised guidance issued by the Institute of Chartered Accountants, that some of those might be problematic. I won't go into lots of the detail here, but do come and talk to us or talk to your existing advisors. Because actually, you'll have, made a, you'll have put some gift aid through from the subsidiary to the parent two or three years ago. That might actually need to be tweaked to make sure that it's actually legal. What else have we got? The regulator issued another consultation this year. And what the regulator wanted us to do um, is there are already requirements on auditors to report <coughs> matters to the Charity Commission. Well, actually, what the regulator now are proposing is that auditors will be required. Every time we issue a non-standard audit report, we report specifically to the Charity Commission. And when trustees or management have failed to act on recommendations that we have put in management letters to trustees for a, in, a, in a subsequent year, again, we would be required to report to the regulators. So you can see where the theme is going. Moira talked a little bit about where the Charity Commission are going with this, and, and this puts a little bit of detail on it. But you can see where, where the theme is there. Those are the, probably the two most controversial parts of that particular um, consultation. Smaller charities, those that are not subject to audit, are subject to something called independent examination, generally, unless they're very small. But actually what's happening there, again there was another consultation, and again what's happening is that the requirements for, 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 for the auditor, for the accountants who act as the independent examiners, those requirements are increasing a little bit. What does that actually mean? It means that as independent examiners, for those smaller charities, would have to do a little bit more work on going concern, would have to do more work on related parties, and conflicts of interest. Again, Moira referred to, to conflicts of interest. Actually making sure that conflicts of interest have been considered and related party transactions have been properly authorised will now come into independent examination as well. So you can see that that regulation is filtering down to, to the smaller charities as well. So it's just things to be aware of um, if, if, you're, if your charity is subject to, to independent examination. My final two slides. You got 6.15 cut off, of course. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, you've got your slide pack. 
Yeah, so I suggest we, we look at those. Thanks, Lloyd. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I'm breaking. The common reporting standard is a standard that's come in um, globally to, um, to help tackle tax evasion. If your charity is sub has more than half of its income from investment income and is subject to the now working, thank you. I think that's what you call user error. Um, so if 40% of your income, or over 50% of your income, is from investments, and part of this is managed under a discretionary mandate by a financial institution, essentially if you've got lots of investment income in that charity, you may be subject to the common reporting standard. Now, the rules here have been shifting over that, and the revenue have been interpreting it in a different way. So we put some, some points on the, on, on, on the two slides. But essentially, if you're a company limited by guarantee, it's likely that you've got no reporting. But if you are caught by the common reporting standard, there's going to be quite an administrative cost. And, and as it says there, the first year was 2016. You have to report to the revenue on that by the 31st of May. Again, talk to your advisors or come and talk to us. Over to Luke. I haven't broken. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, those of you who don't know me or I didn't manage to speak to outside, that is myself, Luke Holt. Uh, I'm a partner in the not for profit group in the city office. I've got two tasks by the look of it uh, to cover my quite mammoth slides in the next four minutes, and secondly, to try not to walk the floor as I've been filmed there. And those of you who've seen me speak before know I like to take a bit of a wander around. The other negative piece of news is what am I going to cover? We're back to fundraising. Rosie talked about fundraising from a legal point of view, what's happening with the fundraising regulator. Where I'm going to take it is effectively your charities, your organisations. What does it actually mean what's changed in fundraising? What do you need to go away from here, think about, and what's going to change in 2017? That's both internally within your organisations, talking at board level, at trustee level, but also what are you going to start reporting externally within your financial statements? Yes, we're talking about more, as my mood said, more in those set of financial statements. Uh, and the Daily Mail could well have a field day in 2017 with some of what is being disclosed, which we'll come on to. Let's not spend a lot of time on here. I think many of you have seen these headlines. We don't need to go back over 2015, the Etherington Review with regards to fundraising, uh, and the absolutely horrific year that fundraising had in 2016. A number of improper practices, I think that's putting it politely, a significant number of improper practices, all the way through from data sharing that we've spoken about, through to poor old Olive Cook, who, uh, who passed away in Bristol. It couldn't continue as it was. The government looked at one point as if they were actually going to get involved, and the lawmakers were going to become involved, and fundraising would be taken away from the charity sector, and we would have legislation that would manage that practice. So Eddington waved his magic wand, pulled a few strings, and we came back to one last chance. And believe me, standing here, it really is one last chance. Where we get to is the fundraising regulator. We're still managing our own fundraising, we're regulating ourselves, but the fundraising regulator is here with some teeth. And as Rosie said, we've already seen the ICO and the fundraising regulator issuing guidance, issuing reports, and some pretty hefty fines. You don't want to be next. Just very quickly there, we used to have a tripartite arrangement with those three organisations, the FRSB, the PRFA, and the IOF. It was the IOF who managed the fundraising code, and as Rosie said, that has moved over to the fundraising regulator. The IRF and the PRFA actually merged. They still exist, but they're more a membership body for fundraising. They're there as the voice of fundraisers to try and rein the fundraising regulator in if they need to, and actually report back their opinion. So they're both still there. Don't uh, let the fundraising regulator believe that, um, that they're not. And you will have seen that logo. You will have seen the website that is there and you'll see a lot more of that logo in 2017. Where are we now? I'll dive through that very quickly because Rosie covered the majority of that. That big red button idea, it's a shame that that has gone from one angle, but actually the small red button, as Rosie put it, of people being able to log on the website and just say, this charity I no longer want to hear from. The only thing that didn't come out in the finalised guidelines that came through is actually, is it all communications? Is there going to be another level of reporting to say, I don't know, British Heart Foundation, and then another list level of, I want to hear about this, I don't want to hear about this, I don't want to hear about this. The 
fundraising regulator is working with um, the IT bobs in the background, it's kind of going to come back to the complexity of that model and as to how we go forward. I imagine we'll probably just end up with an opt-in, opt-out model but watch this space for, for 2017. Now I was going to have a quick quiz, feel free to quiz me afterwards, but effectively this just highlights what we've got from a complexity point of view in the charity sector. If I just flash up a few thresholds, I'm not going to quiz my other partners in the, in the room because they should know what they are, but effectively <laughs> we're left with another one there that is 100,000. In your 2014 annual return that you issued to the Charity Commission, if you had cost of fundraising as it was back then, cost of raising funds as it is under the new sort, of 100,000 or more, you are being asked for a levy by the fundraising regulator. I absolutely love the term voluntary levy, uh, a contradiction in terms of whether you've heard it, um, but effectively, as Rosie said, you've got ratchet system up there, and that is giving them a significant fundraising, uh, sorry, a significant funding to be able to do the work that they are doing. So if you're above 100,000 and you haven't heard yet, those letters are coming out in batches. Mm -hmm. um, you haven't um, been let off the hook. It will mm -hmm. arrive at some point and you'll have a decision to make over that voluntary levy. Just a quick show of hands, if you wouldn't mind. How many trustees have we got in the room? How many charities have we got who do a significant amount of fundraising? Let's say somewhere around 100,000 or above. Excellent. A last question. If I say to you CC20, trustees duties on fundraising how many of you have one heard of it and two read it excellent we've still got some hands effectively that is cc20 it is the charity commission's reaction to everything that happened in fundraising the fundraising regulator and actually what does it mean for your charity uh, and the long and the short of it is if you are a trustee the honest answer is the buck has always stopped with you you are the overall management and guidance of that charity and you should have had control over fundraising, and you should have known if you were doing these practices, if you were working with neat feet, if you were sending 70 communications a week to Olive Cook. But we all know, actually what happened in a small number of charities was the numbers on fundraising came back, if income was bigger than cost, fantastic. A fundraising strategy was developed, and it, was, it went forward over the few, next few years. Those practices are gone, and that isn't gonna cut the mustard for 2017. So CC20, I don't often say it, but it is an excellent read um, from the Charity Commission guidance documentation. It comes back to six principles. On the right-hand side, we've got the, the KS English version, if you want to call it like that. But let's just dive through them quickly. Plan effectively, not rocket science, but if you're doing a big fundraising project, plan who you're going to use, what your cost expect to be, and what your outcome is. Document that. They can't argue that you've thought about that one. Supervise your fundraisers. That is one of the biggest of the six points that really wasn't happening. When you're using commercial participators or professional fundraisers, monitor them, have KPIs, have communications, <coughs> and make sure that's making its way back to trustees and board level to talk about, do we need to change this? Are they still doing the right practices? Complying with fundraising law and protecting your charity's reputation and assets, I think those two are pretty self-explanatory. Follow recognised standards, that's a signpost to the fundraising regulator and the code of fundraising, and then be open and accountable. <coughs> I'll come on to that in the financial statement. But actually, none of those six there, as I said, are rocket science. But somewhere along the line, we've lost that link <coughs> between fundraising and what you should be doing under CC20. So let's try and rejoin those and for 2017 onwards, actually think about fundraising and turn the table back around to people donating and for the public benefit that all of your charities are doing. The Charities Protection and Social Investment Act 2016, again, Rosie referred to one area, section 13, that had these new requirements for when you're working with third parties that had to be put into every agreement and you've got that period of grace until April 2017. The other part, 162A, apologies for the terminology, but it effectively is fundraising information that is required in annual reports for years ended 31st of October 2017 and onwards. So you're sitting here thinking, that's the set of accounts that I'm in at the moment. What are those requirements that I need to put in? First thing to say is it's audited charities only. So a million or above if you're English registered, half a million or above if you're dual registered in uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland or Scotland. What are the areas they're asking you to report in this trustees report at the front that is ever growing larger? You're approached by charities in connection with fundraising activities. That goes back to those six points of the planning, how we're monitoring it and how we're going forward. 
whether the fundraising activities follow a regulated scheme or standard. You don't have to follow the voluntary code from the fundraising regulator. You might have your own code that's even more stringent. You now need to mention it in your trustee report and talk about how you've measured that, how you're making sure your fundraising is as it should be. That's an interesting one, a daily mail, as I would call it. Any failure to comply with the scheme and the standard operated, it's there. So if you talk at trustee level or at board level of we were meant to comply with this and we haven't, it makes its way into your financial statements. There is no de minimis of you're allowed one or two mistakes. It is the minute you don't comply that makes its way through to your trustee report. And that is the most paramount one of the six. There's two more on the next slide. Steps taken to protect vulnerable people and the public from unacceptable fundraising practices. The one piece that I would divert you to is on the Institute of Fundraising website. There is a, a brilliant piece about um, giving failure. It's called or Making Fundraising Fair. And it's all about if you do actually need to talk to people who are in a vulnerable position. If those are your main donors, and we're not saying there's anything wrong with that, it's how to do it properly. Excellent document. It's bedtime reading about sort of 15 pages. Take those back to your charities and think about if that's you from a vulnerable person point of view. And the last two, how they're monitored. We're back to the buck stops with the trustees, but you could have a subcommittee that then reports back up to the board. And the last one, which I think could be interesting, complaints received. I said we're already in the year that you're going to first have to do this. Are you monitoring how many complaints you've had? Actually, it only says the number. You don't have to go into the details of what the complaints were. Because if you've got someone with an axe to grind who starts going against your charity, you, you may get a number of complaints. It's just the number, but it is still disclosed in your financial statements. What does that come down to? You've got to look at those points. You've got to have your systems in place to monitor them. You've got to have your processes to actually track those going through and then you've got your disclosure in your financial statements. So take those away, have a think about it, uh, and as I said, Mahmood and I will be around afterwards for, for any questions. Let's dive in very quickly then to 2017 and beyond. Moira stole a little bit of my thunder here, but I'll let her off. I'm not involved with these charity requirements, I'm a trustee. Computers are satanic. Deadline day falls on a religious holiday. I don't have internet access sent by email. <laughs> Four excuses as to why, again, on double defaulters, financial statements weren't issued in one of two years. The long and the short of it is, there just isn't an excuse. The interesting piece for me was all of these reports, well that's unfair, not all of the reports, but a large majority, when the Charity Commission went in and investigated, actually, submission of documents was the worst of their, uh, the least of their problems. We've had conflicts of interest, we've had um, problems with trustee boards, had problems with legislation and actually the charity being wound up. So the bottom line is no more truthful than it needs to be. Don't let your charity be next. Know your deadline. You may have other deadlines with housing associations, uh, the SFA, FB. Just make sure you're aware of those deadlines uh, and meet them. It's not rocket science and I can't believe I'm stood up here saying it. But There was actually um, something issued from the Charity Commission this morning. I think it's three and a half thousand charities with a March 2016 year end have got till the end of January to submit documents that are outstanding. That's an eye-watering number. A lot of them will still get there, but it's still a huge number that are still working through that process. If you're one of them, make sure you're going to get there. Charity commissions consult on charging. We've already talked about the levy from fundraising. There's another one coming down the road. Expect to see that from William Shawcross and the Charity Commission in early 2017. I think it's actually going to come out by the end of this month. They're effectively saying, we don't get enough government funding now. We want to still be a tooth, tooth regulator. We need your help to take that forward. They're talking around sort of £3,000 per large charity to raise £5 million over two years to actually take what the work they want to do and take it forward. We've talked about the soft landing approach on fundraising contracts. 1st of April is your deadline to make sure you're taking that one forward. Mahmood touched on CRS, May 2017 is first reporting. Come back to us with any questions. And then we've talked about more high profile cases in the future from the uh, Information Commissioner and from the Fundraising Regulator. And then last from me, I was going to put a picture of Donald Trump on it, but every time I learned these slides, I didn't want to look any further, so I went with the flags. Paul already covered a few of these, but actually, we've got a bit more clarity this morning, straight this afternoon, from the Prime Minister as to what Brexit means. We had Brexit mean Brexit, we now have Brexit means Brexit means not in the single market anymore. So actually, a little bit of clarity on immigration and those social issues. Expect to see those as big points to be discussed going forward. 
Just touching very quickly on VAT, there is an opportunity there. As we said, all of our laws had to be in line with the EU. If we do go out of the single market and Brexit happens in two years' time, we've effectively got a free bill of health to talk about VAT, talk about those injustices and the movements, the, the 5% tampon tax, as it's called. Yes, it generates a lot of money for the charity sector, but is it actually a tax that should be there? If you get a chance afterwards, um, Debbie, where are you? Hiding at the back, waving her hand. That's a, a VAT specialist from Kingston Smith. So um, she will talk about other things, but if you've got questions on VAT, go and, go and see Debbie afterwards. Uh, and my favourite one, you can't see on that slide, sorry, but DXU. Sounds like a character from uh, Game of Thrones to me, but it's actually the Department for Exiting the EU that has been formed by the government, Boris Johnson and his others. They're going to provide a lot more information in 2017. They told us it's not going to be a running commentary, but expect to see more on the charity sector on a number of those issues. And expect me to be standing here next year giving you a bit more information before we move to 2018. That is a whistle stop tour from me, guys. You've got my mood and my contact details in your, in your papers. Other than that, let's open the floor for questions and don't give them all to me, please. There's four people sat over there as well. Thank you very much. Who wants to start? Who wants to be bold? That's good news. Swamp with information. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I mean, if you don't have any questions now, please feel free to, to, to have us outside. We'll be, we'll be around. Um, so, any technical questions for the accountants? And, uh, general questions for the lawyers? Thank you, Paul. And um, oh, thank you very much indeed. I mean, I've really just uh, thank you all. A really excellent turnout this evening. I'm very nice to see you here. Uh, do come through and have a, have a drink, maybe even a bite to eat, I think, and uh, have a chat. Meet some other people. Thank you. I know some of you are already filling these out. It would be really useful to have a bit of feedback on the event. Thank you. Yeah. That's probably more of a good one.